we'll keep adding people as they join us, but we'll get the program started. Um, welcome to everyone who's here today. My name is Lori Osborne and I'm the director of the Francis Willard House Museum. And this program today is part of our Views on Women's History series. And we're excited to bring them to you via Zoom um, because we can reach so many people and have speakers who may not live nearby. And that's true today. So we're very grateful to all of you who are here from all over and to, especially to our speaker, Chris Evans today, who comes to us from Boston University. Um, this year, our theme for views is women, faith, and activism. And we're discussing how religious faith of many women activists influence or motivated their activism. You're gonna hear more about this theme during the program. Um, and we're hoping to finish the series this year in April, um, yet to be scheduled speaker, but we're excited about someone we have on tap. So um, we're hoping that it'll come together and we'll, uh, if you're not already getting our email newsletter or connected to us via social media, do that and then you'll be sure to know about the um, April, April talk we're hoping for. In case you're unaware, I'm gonna give you a little bit of background about who we are. The Francis Willard House Museum is the home of Francis Willard, 19th century suffragist and social reformer. Willard was the longtime president of the Women's Christian Temperance Union, which was the largest organization of women in the world by 1895. You can find out more about her home, Willard, and the WCTU on our website, FrancisWillardHouse.org. We're now open in the house and in the archives, um, closed right now for winter in the house, but reopening in March um, and in the archives by appointment only. Um, but we welcome your visit to Evanston when you can be here and online where we have lots on our website about our stories that you can um, explore from home. If you don't like, like I said, if you don't already get our email newsletter, go to the website where there's a quick little sign up form. Follow us on our social media. Those links are on the website too. You can make a donation to support our work and this talk if you would like to also from the website. Um, this program here, all our programs are going to remain free, but we are encouraging those who are able to make a donation if you can. A link's gonna be posted in the chat to that as well. So a little bit of housekeeping, as I said at the top, in order for us to create a video for this event for posting later, we have muted everyone and turned off video feeds. We'll have about 40 minutes of discussion and time for questions. Please put your um, questions in the chat and we'll be monitoring those. Um, Fiona Maxwell, our museum operations manager, will be monitoring the um, program as well as I will be while it's ongoing um, and we'll share your questions too. Um, you can find this video if you would like to share it yourself or want to watch it again. It's going to be on our YouTube channel um, uh, uh, today or, or tomorrow or the next day. So without further ado, I want to introduce my colleague and friend, Janet Olson, our archivist at the Francis Willard Memorial Library at WCTU Archives. And I want to thank Janet for all her work and connecting us, of course, to Chris. Um, and they're going to talk about Chris's exploration of Francis Willard's faith and her activism and a little bit about the collection and um, how Chris has used the collection in the archives too. And Janet will introduce Chris. So thanks again to everyone for being here. Um, enjoy the program. Go ahead, Janet. Okay. Thank you, Lori. And hello, everyone. What a crowd. This is great. Um, Glad to be here. It is such a pleasure to introduce Christopher Evans, today's guest and the author of Do Everything, the long-awaited new biography of Francis Willard, now in production at Oxford University Press. And I say it's long-awaited for two reasons. First, because it's the first full-length biography of Willard since 1986. And second, because I've been following its progress, along with Chris, for five, five years. His first documented visit to the WCTU archives was in 2017. 
Um, and to go back a little further, I first was introduced to Chris by Carolyn DeSwart Gifford back in 1999 at the second conference on the social gospel in Rochester, New York. Later, I was pleased when I heard he was taking on the much needed new biography of Willard. And since then, I've had the archivist's vicarious thrill as Chris plowed through the resources of the WCTU archives during regular week or two week long visits to our cozy reading room. In fact, in March 2020, Chris was the last researcher in before COVID shut us down and the first one to return unmasked during the COVID lull in the summer of 2021. And if you can see, I hope you can see this is a picture of Chris. This, this is this summer when he was looking pretty happy getting towards the end of his work in the archives. And there he is working away in our reading room. So I'm glad that he has chosen Willard's motto, do everything for the title of his book, because he has done everything to present a thorough and multifaceted assessment of Willard's life and work. And he is the right person for the job as his credentials show. <clears throat> Dr. Christopher Evans is professor of history and Christianity and history of Christianity and Methodist studies at Boston University. His teaching and scholarship focus on the history of Christianity, American religion, United Methodist history and ministry studies. He's the author of books, articles and reviews. And his most recent book is The Social Gospel in American Religion, published by NYU Press. Uh, in 2017, and you'll see, actually, you'll see Frances Willard pictured on the cover there. She's everywhere. So um, Chris is also an ordained elder in the Upper New York Annual Conference of the United Methodist Church, and he has lectured, preached, and taught in numerous church and professional settings and been a presenter and or convener at academic conferences. So, and now, Chris, let's talk. First, let's start with your own, well, first you can say hello, and then you can, if you could, tell us why a new biography of Willard is needed, what new sources and methodologies are at play, et cetera. So welcome, Chris. Well, thank you so much, Janet, and my thanks to the Willard House and to the archives for, for putting this event on and uh, for inviting me to do something that every historian loves doing, and that's talking about their own work. I would start off just by saying that for those who, who haven't had the opportunity to visit the Willard House and to do research at the Willard Archives, it's a, just a magnificent collection not only in terms of learning about the life of Frances Willard and the larger work of the women's temperance movement, but also I think the, the broader importance of women's history, particularly in the late 19th and early 20th century. It's an invaluable collection. And I'm very thankful to Janet and other staff of the library who really allowed me to do the kind of research that I hope makes this book unique. In, in terms of why another book on Francis Willard, I would start off by saying that for all of the importance of Willard as a historical figure, and for the ways that I think her life and her, her contributions have been covered over the years in some very important monographs, the, there, there really have not been a flood of biograph biographical studies, studies on Willard, particularly since the mid 20th century. When Willard uh, died in 1898, there were a series of books and biographies published that were really what we would call hagiographical, that were what I would call tribute biographies. And they're quite interesting to read as primary sources. They, they can give you a very interesting perspective on how Willard's peers viewed her. But in a lot of respects, the, the first, what I would see first critical biography of Willard was written by a scholar named Mary Earhart in the 1940s. 
And then the next Willard biography was, was a book published by historian Ruth Borden, who had previously done work on the Women's Temperance Union, uh, Women's Temperance Movement. And her biography in 1986 was the last one. Borden's book, made, a, I think, a very important contribution in terms of talking about the political aspects of Willard's life. It, it raised up, uh, in addition to her role in the women's temperance movement, it emphasized the leadership of women, uh, of Willard in the women's suffrage movement. That, that's certainly a very important component of my book as well. But, but the overall tone of the book was biography was as, as it gave, uh, I think, a lot of expression to the political aspects of Willard. And the, in her own words, uh, analyzing the way that Willard was a political animal that really uh, was pushing women to engage a variety of different social issues and culminating in some respects with the leadership that Willard had in a very important uh, late 19th century third party, the Prohibition Party, which is something perhaps we'll get into in our discussion this afternoon. The, the religious dimension was really left out. And part of what I wanted to do with this book uh, was build on the work of other scholars who were very interested in exploring the, the, the faith of, of Francis Willard, scholars like Carolyn Gifford, who, who were interested in looking at the ways in which Willard was, was, was motivated by her, uh, a time when religion was very much at the center of the culture. So I think my book makes uh, a very important contribution in terms of looking at the role uh, of Will Willard's faith in relationship to social activism, but also the other component that I, I'm quite excited about with my book is the way that I think it cast a new lens on the broader history of women, uh, particularly within the WCTU that, that played, I think, a very, very important part of this story, that Willard did not work in isolation. She was a very charismatic leader. Uh, she was a very compelling force, but I, I hope that my book does cast an important light on the women who were part, not only part of, of Willard's inner circle within the WCTU, but the larger communities of women who were inspired by her, uh, were seized both by her religious zeal to uh, become involved in, in not only temperance, but taking on a wide range of, of reform issues at the time. There we go. Okay, so... Um... And I think ever since, since 1986, a lot of things have changed. Uh, for one thing, you know, different forms of history, different trends in historiography and historical research. And plus, you um, you did have access to, I think, a lot of uh, sources in the archives here that um, had not really been available. So, I, I did indeed. Uh, and I think, again, part of what is remarkable about the, the collection in the WCTU archives is not only that it contains uh, the personal papers of Willard, which include uh, just a, a huge amount of correspondence, uh, both related to other uh, leaders of the women's temperance movement, but a wide range of other women's leaders, uh, most especially exciting for me, was the correspondence between Willard and Susan B. Anthony. Uh, mm -hmm. we, we talk about the, the difficulty of reading Willard's handwriting. Uh, for those of you who have seen uh, Susan B. Anthony's handwriting, I think in some ways her writing is even worse than Willard and, and uh, it'd be very difficult at times to follow. But that is a historian's joy. Uh, for those of you who are historians and joining in, 
uh, you when you have access to the kind of primary sources to source documents, particularly letters, it's very exciting. But also the use of the Willard scrapbooks, the the collection of personal mem memorabilia, uh, much of it collected by either Willard's mother or various WCTU associates who were able to compile that material were were very important to my study, as well as the papers of other influential temperance leaders, women's rights leaders, such as uh, Anna Gordon, uh, Isabella Somerset and others. There's just mm -hmm. a, a wealth of material that that I was able to use that I, I frankly think not a lot of other uh, scholars really before the, well, after uh, the publishing of Borden's biography, you begin to see the integration of these sources. Uh, plus the fact, again, the, the the WCTU uh, uh, online uh, uh, journals that give you give you uh, the the chronicle of Willard's life uh, from a young girl, a uh, young teen to her mature years, the the work of again Carolyn Gifford in terms of her book Writing Out My Heart, which was really the first effort to try to put together a a very clear annotation of those journals, uh, wonderful, wonderful resource. All of these things were, were resources that I was able to take advantage of. Yeah, so, and tell us why this book and why Francis Willard are important to you. Um, tell us, give us your own opinion of Willard and why you felt um, compelled to write the book? Well, Janet, that's a question and I'm going to try to keep my answer short and sweet because I could I could talk for about an hour on that. I think a little bit of my own story is is instructive to uh, to, to kind of give you an idea of why I wrote this biography. I had a vague knowledge of Willard as a historical figure, probably from uh, social studies courses in high school. I, there was never a lot of in-depth information, but I, I tended to recognize her from a, from a couple of pictures, but it really wasn't until I studied at Boston University in the early uh, 80s that I came face to face with Willard through a, a stained glass window of her in the university chapel, Marsh Chapel at Boston University, which was a chapel that was built at the heart of, of BU in the, the 1940s. And then mm -hmm. President Marsh really had a big role in choosing the figures, the historical figures in, in American history who graced those windows. And right next to Abraham, uh, Lincoln is Francis Willard. So that, that exposure got me interested in studying Willard, uh, both when I was a student, a master's student at BU, and then many years later when I was uh, doing my PhD work at Northwestern, I, I really began to become more interested in both the temperance movement, but the, the kind of broader connection in the late 19th century between, between religion and social reform. And, and Willard was an individual, again, who was very much a part of what is commonly called the social gospel movement in American Protestantism that ran from roughly the 1880s into the early 20s. And that, again, that's something we can unpack in uh, in a little bit, I hope. But in a lot of respects, I, I had used Willard in a lot of my writing. She comes up as a very important figure. But the catalyst for me in some respects to write this book was the 2016 election. The Hillary Clinton's defeat was, had, a, had a really deep impact on me because one of the first things I thought about was how difficult, how difficult this would have been for Frances Willard, how painful it would have been for her. When you read her journals, uh, there are these incredibly optimistic writings that uh, predict with a lot of confidence that a day will come probably in the 20th century when, uh, when a woman will be elected president of the United States. How disappointed she would have been 
uh, to see the fact of where we are now, both in terms of our broader political melees, but the fact that yeah, the, the kind of barriers to, to, to women in public life are so, so prevalent in, in many, many ways. The, and, and I think, again, what really excited me about studying Willard and really going in depth into her life was just not only seeing her struggles, but her infectious optimism. In many respects, that optimism was also perhaps something that limited her, particularly later in her life from seeing certain other uh, social issues that kind of put a particular, uh, particular perspective that she was locked into. But, but part of her charisma was coming out of the sense of there are all of these possibilities going on for women at the end of the 19th century. She was a consummate optimist, even in the midst of the, the kind of social problems that engaged her. And, and to, to be honest with you, Janet, I caught a lot of that optimism in my research. Uh, and I think it added a lot to her, to her charisma. So in a lot of respects, after, after really getting, uh, getting to know her from reading so many of her own books, uh, particularly glimpses of 50 years, her magnificent autobiography of all 600, pages, uh, all of her, her books that she published during her lifetime and reading so many sources from scholars and historians who have written about Willard before, I just thought there's really a gap here. And part of it is, again, just catching up with the current uh, source material that's available. But I really wanted to do justice to her religious convictions. Uh, like me, Willard is a Methodist, and in many respects in 19th century America, uh, Methodism was at the cultural center of the nation. It was a barometer in many ways in terms of how uh, Americans were developing. So from the standpoint of that time, Willard would have referred to herself as an evangelical a word that had very, very different meanings back then than, than how we understand that term today. To be an evangelical back in that context, well, first of all, to be a good evangelical, you had to be a Methodist, but it really rep represented this, this kind of vision of, of optimism that, uh, that this was a tradition that was pushing a lot of Americans to look at, at not only questions of pers personal conversion, but the, the way that a lot of Protestant uh, religious groups were involved in social reform causes on the eve of the Civil War, uh, ab the abolitionist movement, uh, the, the women's rights movement or the early women's rights movement, and also the temperance movement. These were not just moral crusades that focused on, again, the idea that people needed to be converted and then a, a more perfect society would emerge. But the idea that, again, that part of what faith gave you was a critical lens to look at the injustices of society and thinking positively about how, uh, how women could play a role in those changes. Another thing that I think my biography makes very, very plain is historically, by all indications, when you look at the history of American religious institutions, who goes to church? Who shows up in Sunday morning? Who raises the money? Who does a lot of the behind the scenes work that builds up institutions, particularly within American Protestantism? This is coming from the women. And, and I think, again, when you look at Frances Willard, she was very much emblematic of a lot of Protestant women of her time, but she was so much more than that. And, and I think when you look at her in relationship to her leadership in the WCTU, uh, this was, and many of you I think are aware of this, the, the, the Women's Christian Temperance Union 
was not just a national movement, it was a global movement. And by the time Willard died in 1898, with a membership of over 200,000, it was the largest women's organization in the world, far exceeding the size of the suffrage organizations, uh, a lot of other women's groups that were being formed out coming out of different, uh, uh, different or organizational efforts, particularly within the context of the 1880s. But the, the role that Willard played uh, as a harbinger of women's political involvement uh, can't be overlooked. And I think, again, the, the, the context of Willard's religious beliefs is the prism by which we can understand how, how, how this, this person made such a, a, a profound impact on the era that she lived. So, yeah, you you've um, talked. We've you and I have talked about about her her impact and and her influences and things like that. And um, so, how did she? Uh, how was more more specifically? How did the faith her faith spur her activism and how did the temperance movement fit into faith-based activism and third ring here um how did that all work with the um with her growing conviction of, of women's equality and work for suffrage sure willard in a lot of respects again i think the key to understanding the type of christianity that uh, Willard practice comes from her her parents. Her her parents, in their own right, tell a, a story about American religion. Uh, Willard had deep deep roots in New England. Uh, then they made the track to uh, Western New York, just outside of Rochester, where they were part of a time period where well that era area was referred to as the burned over district because it was filled with all kinds of revivalistic movements, particularly coming out of traditions like the Methodist. But as, as the Willards moved across the country, I think one of the things that animated Francis Willard so much was this understanding for lack of a better term of religious perfectionism. Now this in some way is a doctrine that has a lot of historical antecedents in, in Christianity. But the other part of this understanding of perfectionism, it really spawned uh, a number of efforts of social reform and, and, and had an influence on social movements like the temperance and the abolitionist movement. Perfectionism, to kind of put this in a very simplistic way, really was this kind of understanding that God's spirit was working within the individual to make them perfect in, in manifesting the love of God. Um, it emphasized to the idea that people could change. A lot of churches, a lot of different religious movements that formed in the early 19th century, I think, oftentimes were reacting against a kind of uh, Calvinistic predetermined predestination understanding that history was fixed and nothing that individuals could do could have any kind of impact on the state of uh, the world or on the individual's status before God. But in a lot of respects, I think Willard imbibed this kind of what we would perhaps call today a conservative theology from her, her mother and father. Although both of her parents, again, were very, very active in social reform causes, particularly abolitionism. But, but it, it, in, the, in the years, particularly uh, when I think Willard was in her 20s, the, the, she, was, she was kind of faced with a dilemma in some way because I think she, she grew up believing in this understanding that everybody was equal before God 
and that part of the goal of Christianity is to in some way build heaven on earth. This again was was sort of this evangelical doctrine of, of hopefulness that you could build a better society on earth. And yet for Francis Willard, one of the questions she constantly wrestled with, well, then if that's true, then why can't women vote? Uh, why can't women politically organize? Why are they shut out from so many areas of service? And most of all, why is the only valid path for women to marry? And for those of you, again, who have studied Willard's life, you know she really wrestled with uh, as a young woman. Should she had been engaged for a while to a Methodist minister, but she broke the engagement. Uh, and, and for all of the ways that her later career tended to emphasize the family, uh, I think again, she, she just was kind of dumbfounded by the idea, well, how can you talk about an equal society and some kind of community of heaven on earth if women are already, even by the nation's churches, seen as, as subservient to men? So in a lot of respects, Willard was, was very indebted to this Methodist tradition of, of what, I, what you would perhaps call today progressive evangelicalism, but she was also very self-critical of it. And, and I think this comes out in many ways in the book when I talk about the ways that she challenged the Methodist church to start ordaining women and how she pushed women in some way to, to challenge male authority within these uh, established religious bodies. Yeah, um, yeah, because one important thing that I haven't read enough about is, you know, that incident in what, 1888, when uh, she wasn't able to be seated as a delegate at a Methodist conference, and then that was followed by a lot of newspaper and everything, correspondence and reaction. And then her next book after that, I think, was Woman in the Pulpit. Mm -hmm. She really, she always expressed herself very clearly in writing um, in, in response to almost anything. She, uh, she did. She did. Yeah. And, and I think, again, when you look at the fact, too, that one of the differences, again, from 1888, from where we are today, the, the struggles of Willard to try to get women admitted to the councils, to the major Protestant denominations were very newsworthy, not just in the religious press, but were covered in newspapers all over the country. And I think one of many heartbreaks in Willard's life. And this is, again, I think as a writer, I found myself really feeling this kind of disappointment in her. Her, her true desire was to become an ordained minister. And that was a goal that was never realized and wouldn't be realized in most Protestant denominations until later in the 20th century. But I think Willard, again, was, was part of a broader public campaign uh, that went on repeatedly throughout most of her adult life to try to get churches as well as uh, other institutions to, to uh, open their doors for women. Yeah. And um, to go back a little bit to the social reform aspect, which of course is one of my favorite aspects of Willard, and that's how I found her when I was working on 19th century social reform, is her interest in, I mean, her support and promotion of social Christianity. Mm -hmm. She called herself a Christian socialist. And, you know, the, the thing, the Christian socialism, social gospel, and social Christianity are, are three of my favorite terms. So um, maybe you can talk a teeny bit about sure. that. Well, Christian socialism in many respects, Janet, is kind of an umbrella term that you, you hear uh, a number of reformers of Willard's generation use. It, it has a lot of or origins within different movements within the Church of England. 
But really by the 1880s in the United States, uh, Christian socialism uh, it was an embodiment of a, of a very idealistic vision of democratic socialism. And, and again, when you talk about the America of the late 19th century, you have a number of uh, third party movements that in some way were very interested in kind of experimenting with democratic socialism. And, and I think Willard was very much a precursor to uh, a number of movements that developed in the early 20th century, where you see a very strong connection between faith-based organization with uh, the Socialist Party in the United States, which for a time period was attracting a number of adherents in the early 20th century. But, but Willard was certainly no Marxist. And, and I think, again, she, she certainly had, at times to her detriment, this kind of understanding of America, demo, American democracy is the pinnacle of the kingdom of God on earth, or that it could be. But I think, again, for her, the, the designation of Christian socialism reflected in her mind, what was the religion of Jesus? What would Jesus believe if he lived uh, in the 1880s, for example, or 1890s, and went to places like Chicago or New York. Um, the, the term Christian socialism in some ways is a very urban based kind of faith uh, that, that really permeates around the social inequalities that were developing in the United States. And the debates that were going on between uh, labor and capital, uh, the, the growing attack of a number of groups that we would identify with the burgeoning progressive movement uh, that really came to fruition in the early 20th century. But the idea, again, that part of the purpose of faith was to live out this kind of religion of Jesus. What would Jesus do if he lived uh, in the midst of uh, a country where you saw a, such a tremendous imbalance of wealth and privilege between the few who were very rich and the poor masses. So in a lot of respects, part of the story of Willard's Christian socialism, I think is it starts with the support of the American labor movement, which again, from the standpoint of the 1880s was a pretty radical thing for respectable, uh, Protestants, particularly Protestant women like Willard, to, uh, to take on. But it went from that to, I think, a very much a, a, a strong condemnation towards the end of her life of American capitalism. Uh, she, she very uh, optimistically, uh, although perhaps somewhat naively decided at the end of her life that what we are called to do as women who call ourselves Christian is to work for the eradication of poverty on a national and global level. A wonderful goal. Uh, and sadly, again, if you, it, I, I said a moment ago, perhaps she was naive, but when you look at some of her speeches, when she talks about the commission of faith to eradicate poverty, it, it really does reflect upon, I think, later reformers that we have seen in the 20th century that have looked at issues like economic justice, uh, globalization, militarization, and have, have seen the need to kind of move in the direction of more radical solution, economic solutions. Oh, I I really like the in learning about Willard. I like to to, to see how you know the, the idea of the kingdom of heaven on earth is brought about by social reformers, yeah, by Christian social reformers. Anyway, we could talk about Christian so socialism. And, and Willard we had have. a very deep personal faith. I mean, I think when yeah. you read her 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 journals, when you look at her speeches. There, there is this sense that for her, strong work uh, of, in terms of faith really does need to come out of a very deep-seated 
uh, spiritual core. Um, that, that there needs to be that uh, sense of personal commitment, uh, the idea again of trying to live a sanctified life, but, but also the goal of faith is, is working towards the betterment of society, that, that that is the means to sort of this broader end of creating a heaven on earth, or as they would say back then, kingdom God, kingdom of God on earth. She did have a very works righteous faith, uh, it has to be said. But uh, I think, again, this was very much a part of her optimism and part of her appeal to other women and men as well of, at the time. Um, okay, to tie this up a little bit, although we could talk to hours, and we have, um, so how do we in the 21st century understand the role that faith played in her life? Because it really is quite a bit different now from her time. Uh, religion isn't a topic that historians have covered in the recent past. But um, as we, as you've said, anyone living in the 19th century, religion would have been a central part of their lives. So um, do you think it will make that this will make it harder for people to, some of your readers to relate to Willard's experience. And once again, where's, you know, how do we understand the role? How, how, how can we understand the role of her faith in her life? Janet, that's, a, that's an excellent question. And, and I think in part the, I'm not, I'm not sure about that. I, I do think again, the role of religion, particularly institutionally speaking, has changed a great deal since, since the end of the 19th century, as it has from even, say, 50, 60, 70 years ago. So there, there are a lot of questions you could ask. I, I think for me, the, the overarching question, and, and I, got, I have to say this is part of the historian's rant. Um, History for some people, I was born with an innate love of history. I have found over the course of many, many years of teaching that sometimes history, particularly for younger people, can be a difficult sell. Uh, but I do think that there is a part of our identity as a nation where we've always have kind of been that way. We've, we're, we, we tend to be ahistorical. Now, some people might want to challenge me on that, but I think again, Mer Americans are very good at myth making at times, but they they seldom want to dig deep into the foundations of those myths and how they stand up to historical realities. I do think part of what Willard speaks to Janet quite well is for all of the changes. In, in the way that religion is perceived and perhaps its public role today. Uh, and I would argue, I think again, religion is still very important to understanding American, America's past and its present for a lot of, lot of examples now of how it points to a lot of what's problematic about America. But I think part of the connection between our time and the present is Willard speaks to spiritually restless people. Uh, Willard loved Methodism and in some ways she was very tied to uh, the, the Methodist church. But there was a point too where I think she expressed the kind of restlessness of what we perhaps would call today uh, faithful or spiritual, but not necessarily religious in a, convention, a conventional sense. Uh, I see this in, in my years of teaching. Uh, and again, for those of you who, who are not familiar with my background, uh, I have spent most of my academic career teaching in theological seminaries. I spent many years uh, at Colgate Rochester Crozier Divinity School uh, actually not too far from uh, Willard's ancestral home in Churchville, New York, and now for the past 12 years at Boston University. And, and I find particularly with a lot of younger students that I've worked with, 
there, there is a sense that they are raising profound and very deep-seated questions of faith, but their confidence in institutional religion is, is wavering. And there are, I think, again, a lot of reasons for that, particularly in a contemporary context of why many young people have either uh, turned away from churches or left them altogether. And there was the same angst in Willard, Willard's time, they're, they're particularly on issues of women's representation. Uh, one of the things that Willard occasionally would sort of flirt with was the idea of saying, making statements like, well, maybe women should just go off and found their own religious institutions. And that was something that really got her male critics nervous. Uh, so it, it reflects, again, this kind of tension that we find historically uh, as different as the as the, the Willard's historical context is from today, you still see those parallels, and and I think that's something again that my biography, I I hope will will be very edifying for somebody not only to learn about the past but think about some of these issues about Willard's faith and religion in terms of how they tie in today. Well, I think, Chris, at this point, um, we should probably uh, answer some, <laughs> you should answer some questions. Excellent. And, and, Excellent. and I know that um, that you, uh, a lot of what, most of what we talked about was the aspect of faith in, because that's the topic of our series. And of course, the biography has a lot more in it. And so may, maybe some of the questions that we get today, we'll, we'll ask, we'll address, you know, additional aspects that you can instantly respond to. I'm so gonna, I think I'm going to pull some forward um, that I've been uh, um, collecting as we've been talking. And this has been so interesting. If you if anyone has additional questions, um, now's the time to start putting them in chat, and I'll do my best. to add. But the first one I noticed, um, is talking about the split in the Methodist church in the uh, in her time period between the North and the South and what, um, if any um, uh, thoughts or, or, you know, anything that Willard had to say about that or, and, and you know, maybe a little bit of background about that time period, what was sure. going on in the churches and then if Willard had anything to say, especially in the Methodist church. Sure. Well, the, the split, lorry that you're referring to, there, there were several that took place before the Civil War, and a number of them, well, really most of them revolved around the issue of slavery. So in 1844, the Methodist Church, which at that time was the largest Protestant church of the country, went through a split. Uh, so you had two uh, rival Methodist churches what was called the Methodist Episcopal Church, was the, which was the Northern Methodist Church, uh, which and the larger of the two, and then the Methodist Episcopal Church South. So essentially it broke along regional lines, although if you look at say Kentucky, Southern Ohio, uh, parts, of, parts of Maryland, West Virginia, you see again that kind of tension along the border where you would oftentimes have both of these churches neighboring one another. But that was a split, again, that really I think uh, many historians have pointed to that it, it happened uh, about 17, 18 years before the beginning of the Civil War and really prefigured the, the, uh, the Civil War in some way. Um, it, it was a very uh, violent, it, well, I shouldn't say violent, but it, it was a conflict that took many, many generations to heal. And frankly, it never fully was. I mean, I think when the two churches finally re-emerged in the 1930s, and it was a time period, again, where major Protestant denominations split over the slavery issue. Uh, and this is a longer conversation, but when the church did, when the Northern and Southern churches remerged in 1939, they never dealt fully with the issue of race. Uh, and in many respects, again, this is part of a larger American story, I think, of, of how questions of race and racism 
from that time period are still very much in the forefront of uh, what America is dealing with now in terms of that issue. Yeah, did did Willard ever comment or talk about the, this this division, or um, it was something that would she just sort of was she grew up in it, um, and it was just uh, part of her the, the her church life was these two, this so is that the case? I I think Willard dealt with it. Uh, kind of in a tangential way, Lori. She, mm. the thing you have to remember too, and this is for those of you who are from Evanston, you, you are already aware of this. Evanston was the cradle of Northern Methodism. You, you could probably throw the greater Chicagoland area in it, but, but Evanston was kind of the Methodist version of, uh, of uh, the city upon the hill. <laughs> it was the it was the nerve center of Northern Methodism, and and Willard clearly saw the North as uh, that was the main part of her engagement. Again, keep in mind that in for much of the 19th century and even into the 20th century, to a degree, Northern and Southern Methodists really didn't recognize each other. It was starting to change quite a bit by the time that Willard died, but uh, her Methodist world was really rooted in the North, although she spoke in the South quite a bit. Yeah, and yeah, yeah, and yeah. she did get to know certain Methodist leaders and thought in the very Southern Methodist highly of, of, yeah. of those leaders. Yeah, maybe <laughs> um, there is a question about um, Francis Willard's relationship with Ida B. Wells sure. and um, it's such an important thing. Um, I've always been very interested in, Wells is, is the next generation of activists after Willard, um, but they did share the Methodist faith and they had they many did. things yep. in common, including that, um, but um, from two different generations of women activists, um, we've done a project if you want to know go in depth um, you can visit our website and look at the project that we've done about the conflict between Willard and Wells but Chris maybe you can talk a little bit about what you've included about it in the book and and your thoughts about that in terms of um, Willard's faith and the tradition around um, um, her you know the the church's role and all of that um, Thank you for asking, Laurie. And, and one of the things that I just, I think was just published, put in the chat, is just drawing attention to uh, the, the Willard House uh, website, Truth Telling, which looks at, in depth at the relationship between Willard and Ida B. Wells. There, there's a chapter of my book devoted to that confrontation. And really, again, as many have pointed out, this is a, a, a certainly to a degree, a mark on Willard's legacy. There, there are many different dimensions to this. And I think that in many respects, Laurie, particularly when I talked earlier about the, the narrowness of, of Willard's vision in certain respects, I think certainly race was one of them. Uh, I note in my book that for all of the ways that I think Willard grew on a number of social issues, she had kind of a stagnant view. She kind of came back to a lot of the same ideas about race and racial justice. Now, she came from parents who were strongly in support of the abolitionist movement. But I think like a lot of white abolitionists, there, there was a tendency of, of again, I think particularly of, the, of, of Willard's parents' generation, not all white abolitionists, but some to see the eradication of slavery and, and particularly Northern victory in the Civil War in kind of uh, uh, messianic terms. Mm. Uh, this was a galvanic event that was going to solve the race problem in the United States once and for all. Well, of course, if you 
uh, if you read uh, people like Wells and, and certainly Frederick Douglass's work, uh, David Blight's outstanding biography that came out a few years ago that documents the way that Douglas was trying to tell a lot of white uh, anti-slavery activists, we, we have a lot of more, more work to do. And yeah. then you have a very complicated history around reconstruction, uh, a lot of excellent work uh, written on that. And I think Willard just closed out. I think again, there, there were efforts in the WCTU to make important overtures to African-American members. And, and I think, again, the, the history of African-American, uh, African-Americans in the WCTU is its own really, really fascinating story. But I think Willard just got to a point where she, she used, she had a very simplistic view of how racial justice could be achieved. And I think too, again, part of what I really point out in the book is that Willard wanted to build a bridge between Northern and Southern women. Mm -hmm. And I think part of her ultimate ambition was to try to create a political coalition of women uh, that would back a third party in the United States that would be supporting temperance, suffrage, and also to a degree, Christian socialism. Uh, when the Wills, when the controversy with Wells began, Willard was at kind of, and I get into this a lot in the book too. She reached a point in her leadership in the WCTU, I think, where uh, her vision, her ability to get people to follow her own visions was severely tested. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot in my book about some of the conflicts that she had with different women in the WCTU, who frankly, from my perspective, were trying to stage a coup. Mm -hmm. uh, she was also spending most of her time again by 1893 in England, where mm -hmm. she was wor working very closely with British reformers to build the, the WCTU as, a, as kind of a global movement of, of women. So in a, in a lot of respects, what I find very painful, and, and I think I tell this story, I'm, I, to a degree, I show some sympathy to, to Willard. Uh, I think there were personal reasons why she didn't engage Wells. Uh, but I also wonder, even if it had been a different point, I just don't know if her response would have been different. Yeah, and, I've often wondered about that too myself with her mother dying in the same time. There's there's just a number of things, not to make any excuses yeah. for her at all, but it is interesting watching her, you know, visionary approach to leadership and reform start to shrink and narrow in this time. And she just doesn't see Wells as the rising leader when she's seen so many other women. So that is a whole yeah. nother topic. I'm very glad to hear. Yeah, um, and I just want to add one thing, Lori, before. Sure. <laughs> uh, about the fact that, you know, Wells' controversy with Willard sort of really did cast a shadow on Willard's reputation, especially in modern times when we think about Willard. And I, that's a, one reason why the truth-telling exhibit that we've worked on has been um, helpful for us, but also the fact that it, um, we realized that there were there were a lot of uh, African American women involved in the WCTU and exploring, you know, before, you know, from the mid 1880s and exploring their role, what they were doing, what they saw in the WCTU, et cetera, I, I think is important to as context for the Willard and Wells um, difficulty so that the Willard and Wells thing doesn't stand as a, a you know one separate thing it's it's part of a continuum of in Willard's life so and, and we are as I keep mentioning we are working on a project about determining more about Willard uh, about WCTU women who are African-American yeah That's all we that. have many many things to tell one and of the for, things um I want to maybe we could wrap up with um 
your final thoughts. We're getting to the top of that hour and I wanna be mindful and careful of everyone's time. There's been some really good questions. We will have the chat. Um, and if you asked a question that's a little bit research focused, I'll be sure to, to save that chat and send it along to Janet so she can um, um, maybe respond. Um, but Chris, your, your final thoughts about Willard's faith and her, you know, that sense of origins in her, from her family and its connection then into this reform um, activism that, that grows, you know, she doesn't start um, either as a firm Christian or as a firm reformer. Um, this is an evolution over her life. Um, and, you know, she's exploring both of them really at the same time as she's growing and changing. So um, maybe talk a little bit about that and, sure. and your experience of telling the story over time. For me, when I look at Willard and part of the thing that I found so exciting about doing the research for this book was, was just the variety of, of people that she intersected with on, on, on more than a superficial level. Um, certainly the charismatic leadership is something we can talk a lot about, but she had an ability to give it people that she was meeting a, a real sense that they were the most important person in, in the world at that moment. And this included uh, politicians, uh, religious leaders, women's rights leaders. I, again, for, for all of the ways that sometimes Willard had conflicts with women like Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton, they were, those two were uh, in awe of her po power in some ways. Uh, Susan B. Anthony wrote of Willard that she had an almost like a cult power to just get you to follow where she was going. Uh, and, and I think again, the, the way that she was able to sort of carry women, uh, men as well, but really women, because that, that's the central focus of my biography. I want to learn more about the women who are following her. But what she did, and what I hope I show in the book, is that I think for, for, for many women, uh, there, there was a sense, again, that this was a person who, who really was on to something important, not just in terms of temperance, but how do women achieve a place at the table with men? How do they finally get a voice that they can be heard? Um, and at a time period where women like Anthony and particularly Stanton were often seen as way too radical, Willard played on her acceptability. I mean, she was seen as a very proper embodiment of American womanhood. And she used oftentimes very traditional language. But I think part of what she did too and this is part of her broader legacy into the 20th century, I think, Lori. Um, when you look at a number of initiatives of social change, there, there's, you, can, you can look to caucuses, you can look to certain groups uh, who are engaged in legal activism, and you, can, you have marchers. But in a lot of respects, I think Frances Willard uh, contributed to a tradition of largely uh, middle-class women, oftentimes white women, but not exclusively, uh, certainly in terms of her international influence, uh, it moves beyond sort of a white Western world, but, but within church groups, within uh, a movement of women's clubs, uh, uh, oftentimes quite well-educated women, but women who were very interested, again, in building political clout, whether it was in churches, whether it was in civic organizations, whether it was in businesses, political activism, settlement houses. There are so many ways, again, that you can track, I think, the way that Willard uh, made a difference, uh, 
not just in terms of the temperance movement, but larger campaigns for women's equality in politics, in churches, and certainly again in in just the broader legal, their, their, their changing legal status in American life. I think there's a lot more work that needs to be done, uh, but I hope my biography makes a good start towards, uh, towards understanding the, this broader importance. Well, we're really looking forward to seeing it in publication. And I want to thank you so much, Chris. It's been a great talk today. Janet, do you want to wrap things up? Uh, sure, just say, to thank, say thank you, Chris. And of course, we want a signed copy of that book, Hot Off the Press. <laughs> you got it. You got it. And I hope it will be out this fall. One of the things I wanted to mention to the group, too, uh, I see I saw a lot of chat questions come up in the chat. Uh, please don't, I'm, I would love to hear from you if you get a chance. Uh, my email is chevans at bu.edu and uh, would, would love to hear your questions. Oh, and I want to say it was great to see so many names in, in the uh, popping up in our audience of people who have been to the archives, people that I, I've had the opportunity to talk with. And so I'm, I'm glad so many of the, the Willard fans were available to come and we're, listen to this talk. Yeah, and the final questions is that the book looks like it's possibly later this year, fall of yes. this year. So yeah, yeah. you will certainly hear about it from us um, when it comes out. And we want to thank Chris. Thanks everyone for coming today um, and stay in touch. There will be more from us about all of this too. Thanks so much. Thanks care, everybody. Everyone. I've enjoyed the conversation. Thank you. Thanks.